Monk's mood. Wow. <laughs> Masterful. It's, uh, that is uh, quite a piece. Um, it breaks all the rules. Um, and <laughs> just a couple of things. My first impressions are that on that opening solo uh, introduction that he does, it's about almost three minutes long. Right. Um, the way he chooses which notes to sustain and which ones not to sustain you know, that some have this kind of quick attack and then others resonate. Uh, and mm. and that use of the sustain is almost like n added notes to the solo. I, it, and, and maybe I'm just because I'm very heightened listening, you know, uh, at this point. But that, that really struck me, the way he was using sustain as a musical device. Yeah, well, that, that's part of that's a real big part of the art form that he's presenting. He's presenting you with these weird, well, weird is a bad word, but uh, uh, um, unique resonances. He's taking you on a journey. The composition's designed to take you on a journey. Then the way he arranges it, and especially the way he voices the chords, and sometimes there's a grace note. Sometimes. It, that kind of activates an upper overtone. Sometimes the notes are meant to kind of like thud and sound like they're made out of wood and just sound kind of dead and go disappear. Sometimes the whole thing is kind of like a cascading, shimmering kind of bright sound. And like all these different kind of sounds are coming at you. He does that on the piano. Right. It's one thing to do that on a reed or on a trumpet or with your voice, but to make piano notes bend how did it's kind of a miracle of modern science that is Thelonious Monk <laughs> yeah yeah very very and then also compositionally in the way the piece is performed there's lots of stops and starts and it doesn't yeah he does that on purpose that's his style he he's got he knows it, it's all mapped out he knows exactly what he's going to do every bit of the way because he's a total freaking genius but he does those hesitant moments so you can feel the preponderance of it all so that it draws you in so that you dig it. You dig, right? And that's what he would say. He's drawing you in, that pause. And then, bam, he delivers this unusual sound you never heard before. And then, you know, when you, when you tear it apart and look at it, you're like, yeah, okay, it's a B-flat 7 with an E major triad on top. It's, a, it's the polytone... Uh, tritone Stravinsky chord, voiced that way. Yeah, yeah, that's what it is. But man, he draws you and he makes you feel it. It's great. Yeah, and and then the the duet that's kind of the centerpiece. I mean, you've got the bass comes in just f for a brief. Yeah, that's Wilbur Ware, of course. Yeah, yeah. that's Wilbur Ware right and, there. And yep. he kind of comes in at the end of that solo with the kind of thump, 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 and then disappears yeah. for the for the duet in the middle between the sax and yeah. the piano, and then. Not until that final section does the bass kind of add, you know, does it become a trio briefly before the end. Right. And uh, Train's already showing uh, his influence from the Slonimsky's Thesaurus of Scales and Melodic Patterns. It's this kind of overly uh, numerical book that we'll get into talking about that led to Giant Steps, his chapter uh, chapter. Uh, chapter two is what led into Giant Steps. We divide the octave into three parts. He's using a lot of stuff where you divide the octave into four parts, those symmetrical diminished sounds. And that's already not Bird. Bird didn't do those too much. Bird did whole tone stuff, and he did he did some augmented stuff, but not this kind of symmetrical diminished stuff. So you, now Train's already adding to the harmonic lexicon of of Bird. And then I think one of the virtuoso things here, aside from the amazing tone and how the intonation sits with the piano, is so unique. There's not, no other tenor player is doing this yet. This is him first. But it's the ornamentation on this piece. The, the, the way he gets to the big note. Mm -hmm. There's these little notes that go into it. That A lot of them are in the palm key on the upper register of the tenor saxophone. And you hear everybody after train... Has to has to is influenced by that myself included. This is a, how you get the how you get the that one note to be really beautiful is how you approach that note and kind of give it give it uh, like a more of a singing quality to it than just like playing the note, right? Right. That's cool. Yeah. So uh, we've got a second cut from the same album and another famous uh, famous uh, jazz standard, "Ruby, My Dear." 
And this was recorded uh, in July. So this was that other one was recorded in April '57. So this is later. Now, now Train's really kind of in the band, and Monk has decided to augment this session with Coleman Hawkins and Shahib Habab and uh, Art. You know, Art Blakey is on drums now, and uh, so this record's got kind of a blowing kind of thing to it. Except on this track. This track is this track is going kind of going back to the the Ruby My Dear. Uh, Train and Monk Ballad thing. This has got some tour de force glissandi. This is great. Yeah, and uh, I guess, you know, this may be one of, if not Monk's most famous tune. And again, over the years, it's been covered by everybody from uh, Kenny Drew and Bud Powell, uh, Art Farmer, uh, McCoy Tyner, Larry Coriel, uh, you know, all sorts. Uh, Over the years. Well, and I think... Think about how many giant classics Monk has. You know, Straight No Chaser, Round Midnight, Ruby My Dear, Monk's Mood, Monk's... You know, it goes on and on. This is amazing. What a great composer. Ask me now, you know. But uh, this this ballad of all of them captures the Hudson River, New York skyline, Manhattan thing on an autumn day. I don't know. I mean, it's just like... Uh, it's like portraiture. It's beautiful. All right, let's listen to Ruby, my dear, from the album Phony Smunk and John Coltrane. Well, that was a cool little uh, last little flourish that he did. Oh, yeah, that's a classic monk. He's got about six different endings in D flat that he does, and those were, those were three of them yeah. all at the same time. Yeah. <laughs> well, also here we've got the virtuosity. I mean, with both these monk tunes, um, and for both musicians, the virtuosity of of uh, note choice. You know, yeah. Where? Yeah, well, that's built into the composition too. And monks showing you how to do it through the writing. Yeah. With the, uh, it's not just a G minor seven. It's a G minor seven voiced like this. With this as an alternate note that sets it off that way, and it's all done on purpose. That's the genius of Monk. Yeah, yeah and th- that uh, was the second part. And some of the chords sound so weird, you know, when you look at them, like there's this weird B7 with the flat 9 and a B flat 7 with a flat 9, and he plays an E triad or E7 on top, and then he goes to A whole tone at the end, and then he goes to A flat and plays like weird resonant A natural against A flat, and all of a sudden you end up on a beautiful almost like Debussy style D flat chord with six, nine, six, nine, six, nine. And then the Lydian, the Lydian flourish at the end that you were talking about. And then he goes on the bottom and plays that low D flat all the way at the bottom of the piano. You're like, that's just genius, man. I, I've been copying this shit for years. (laughs) I love it so much. And he, you know, one thing I wanted to bring up, he did in the last song too. They do the classic, very often they're going to do the classic ballad arrangement. Because you don't want to play too many choruses at the death tempo. It gets boring. You don't want to overstate the A section melody too many times because it's like, yeah, we already heard that five times, you know? Right. So what, so what they do is they play A-A-B-A song form. Then one guy solos, usually a half chorus, maybe sometimes a full chorus if he's real good like Train. Then Monk comes in with a half chorus and Monk makes the cue bridge out. So then you, everybody comes back in with the melody on the bridge so you don't play the A section too many times. And then you do the A section one last time, outro, end. That, that goes way back. All the old guys used to do that. That's part of the ballad. I call it the ballad presentation. It's like a, a way of presenting this ultra-romantic, hyper-romantic ballad presentation. Mm. And it's, it's tight. It's, it's very... I don't know. I don't know if they rehearsed it a lot, but it's something that they all did a lot together, and it's a thing. You know, it's a real like it's a jam session thing. You know, you think of jam sessions as always being medium up tempos where guys could wiggle their fingers a lot and compete with one another. You know, you know, uh, musically sparring and all that. But man, that jam, that the that ballad thing, that's that's a thing, especially on tenors. Yeah. Um. So uh, that's Lonnie Smunk and John Coltrane playing. Those unique monk compositions, uh, quirky and mysterious, but still uh, in that ballad tradition. Um, and now we move to um, an album of John Coltrane's, still from 1957, called Lush Life. 
<clears throat> and named after the famous song. And the first cut we're going to hear, though, is uh, Like Someone in Love. And at the time, it was a popular song uh, composed by Jimmy Van uh, Heusen with lyrics by Johnny Burke. And it was written along with Sleigh Ride in July, um, <laughs> uh, which became a, a Christmas jazz standard. Um, for the 1944 film Bell of the Yukon. <laughs> Big smashing success. <laughs> where it was sung by Dinah Shore. Um, it was a hit for Big Crosby in 1945. And and after that became a jazz standard. So, like, so many... Did these, ja did these jazz guys get it from the radio? Like, listening to the singers sing it? Or did they, did they go to these shows? You know, that's a really good question. I would bet that since this was... Uh, a uh, radio hit that in that reached number fifteen on the you know charts. Yeah, okay. That right. that's maybe where you'd first hear it. Um, and now I've heard I've heard a lot about like legendary stories of Errol Garner going to all kinds of Broadway show premieres and blowing everybody's mind by memorizing every tune immediately, like Mozart style. Wow. And having them all ready to go in any key the next day. You're just like, how the fuck do you do that? Wow. You know? <laughs> I know. Easy for him. Could be musical legend. Yeah, right, maybe. I don't know. It could be musical legend, but I love that. I love stories like that. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, you know, again, New York, Broadway, you know, this was popular entertainment back then. And it, Right. You didn't have, really have too much TV. TV was like a new thing. It hadn't siphoned off the audience to boring TV yet, right? Yeah, yes. Like if you, if you wanted entertainment, you had to go out. Yeah, exactly. Go hear music. You know, you weren't at place. your home movie theater at, at the house, at least streaming shit like you are now, right? Yeah, but I think when you combine the, the recordings and the shows and stuff, it's also just kind of in the zeitgeist, right? It's in the air. It's a part of, it's a major part of the culture uh, where now Broadway is an exclusive thing. You have to have $800 to get a ticket to go see Hamilton. You know? Oh my God, right, right, and, right. And so, but back in the days, movies, uh, which were then often made from the musicals, that was, it was uh, cheap to get into a movie theater back then. It, and that was the whole point of right. movies was to keep the price low and yeah. give the common man, the everyday man, a really high class experience. Um, yeah, baseball, baseball comes to mind too, right? That was like the people's entertainment. You're supposed to bring your sandwiches and radishes for a dollar and go watch a baseball right. game. Yeah, bring the whole family. It didn't, you know, it didn't cost a thousand. Yeah, now it costs hundreds of dollars. If, and if not thousands to go see a game. Yeah. So uh, anyway, um, over the years, uh, this is a, obviously a popular song for singers. Um, you've got Ella Fitzgerald, Perry Como, Sarah Vaughan, uh, also covered by Frank Sinatra, always. You've got Charles Mingus, Bud Powell, Johnny Mathis. And it was kind of a signature tune for Art Blakey. Oh, no, I'm sorry. I'm on Lush Life, right? No, 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 yeah, this one. Yeah, Like yeah, Someone in Love. Yeah. No, Art Blakey. Yeah. It was, yeah, yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I mean, my experience with this, with Like Someone in Love, this is one of those standards that that you, you're expected to know. Right. And you're, you're most likely going to be asked to play it in A flat or F because Stan gets Sonny Rollins, Train, Art Blake, you know, just go down the whole fucking list. Everybody plays this song. This is one of the standards that's top standards that everybody plays. So, and once again, Train is... Uh, He's giving it a unique, there's something unique about how Train does. He does it a little slower. It's a little bit more, I don't know, mysterious. And he, the reason why I picked this, he puts on a freaking tour de force of like mm, uh, spelling out the bebop harmony on the saxophone with, with your lines. Linear bebop conception is, is, is masterful here. I used to, when I, when I was first getting, when I was first getting, down with train really getting down with train this was my fall asleep record i'd put this record on you know lay down with headphones on and this was the i don't know if it was the first track on the record but it was certainly the first track on my cassette tape back in the day and it just used to move me how that there's no piano on it it's just earl may art taylor and train and something so spare and delicious about it without the harm without the piano uh, kind of uh making the vertical harmony, you know, and this is just the way the two lines are going. And Earl May, I don't know whatever happened to that guy, but I really love his playing on this album. Now, I, uh, now what what uh, instrument is he playing? He's playing bass. bass. Yeah, that's a name he, I'm not familiar yeah. with. Yeah. 
Yeah, he's like one. He's one of my. Him and Carl Brown are my like two secret weapon bass players that are on one record and nobody's heard of them. <laughs> you know what I mean? Interesting. Carl Brown's on the Steve Steve Lacey record with Don Cherry called Evidence, which I've been stealing off that record for over thirty years. I love that record, and part of it's because Carl Brown is playing gut strings and it sounds eerie. It sounds very eerie. Uh, you're not sure what notes it are, they are all the time. It doesn't matter. It's just so eerie. And Billy Higgins and him are hooking up, making this. I don't know if it, I don't know if it was the dope that day, but man, they're getting an eerie, eerie feeling in their music. That's that's so gold. Mm. <laughs> okay, um, but we're uh, uh, we're gonna turn back to uh, Coltrane and to Earl May. It's <laughs> yeah. a ballad, uh, uh, the standard classic standard, like "Someone in Love" from the album uh, Coltrane album "Lush Life." <laughs> 